Okay, so do you think that you could be here on Sunday at 10 o'clock? Yes, I could okay. be. Okay, and you guys will be here? Yeah. yeah. You know what, let's open up the windows. It's really nice outside. I'm like, I think we should do that. Ryan, we'll use some more light in here. Okay. Yes. Whoa, look at that paint. We better, maybe we don't want to have the windows open. Might be better to be in the dark about that. Jerry, I'm really glad we cut those trees down. They were growing too tall, getting out of control, and kind of ugly. Yeah, I think it was needed, but look what it displayed now. Look, we got, we see the damage it's actually done to the building. Now we're going to have to do something about that. That's true. Who's ready to go to Sunday school? Don't worry, parents. I'm a certified lifeguard. Will we still be able to swim down here after they fix the floor? As we go God's way, we pray that you will be generous in your giving to help maintain our church home and provide a welcoming space for all who gather here. Going God's way, providing a welcoming space. Thank you for joining me today in a little video tour of Bethany. A special thanks to Brian McGuire for being our pilot on the aerial portion of this trip around Bethany. 2020 projects for Bethany providing a welcoming space included painting the exterior of our church to give it a new and fresh look along with the cleaning of the brickwork and repair to the wood on the canopy and around some windows. New cupboards and countertop in the front office, plus both the front office and pastor's office were painted. Fresh new wall decor was also added. What a friendly, inviting feel. The walls of Fellowship Hall were brightened with a fresh coat of paint. Nice. Check out the backyard. We continued our landscaping improvement projects. Volunteers work hard to trim tree branches and to clear out unwanted brush and shrubs along our back property line. As we look forward to 2021 projects for providing a welcoming space, we look toward fixing our water issues in the basement. This will protect the foundation of our church. Water comes into the basement when spring snow melts happen and when rainwater pours in. After having multiple contractors review our property, it is believed that much of our problem is a result of our landscaping. Due to the land changes over time, we have water moving toward the building foundation and into the basement instead of away from it. We hope to be able to have the land reshaped to provide water flow away from the building. To go along with the landscaping, we also are in need of rain gutters on a portion of the building to help provide better water diversion. With your continued generous giving, we can accomplish these goals. Going God's way, together. Good morning and welcome to Worship at Bethany this beautiful Sunday morning. It's good to have you here with us. Today, our service starts differently than you might be used to. On March 4th, the ELCA Conference of Bishops affirmed a statement during their virtual meeting. And this is the statement, this is part of the statement that they affirmed. The COVID-related surge in anti-Asian violence is physically and spiritually assaulting Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. This violence reemerged from America's historical and pervasive sin of racism. 
Asian American and Pacific Islander children and adults are facing assault with racial slurs, bullying, spitting, physical injury, and even death. These are not new in communities where people of color live. These violent acts of racism have and are happening in cities and towns across the United States. The virus of racism cannot be allowed to run rampant. We, the Association of Asian and Pacific Islanders, ELCA, call on our church to once again unequivocally denounce racism by taking immediate actions to defend, protect, and uphold the safety and lives of Asian Americans. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us that we are one body with many members. This member of the body is suffering. Let us bear this suffering together as one body. And there were several points that they highlighted, several things that they called on the church to do. One is to model the example of Jesus, whose compassion was made visible by acts of love, culminating in embracing bodily harm to save us. To undergird and measurably advance its fight against racism and apathy in all expressions of the church. To model how to tap into Jesus' deep empathy as our collective power to stand against violence and promote the way of Jesus instead. And there were several other points, including declaring one Sunday in Lent to lament in order to express solidarity, help in healing, and support the victims of violence against Asian Americans. Well, today was the Sunday that was uh, appointed to be the day to lament the violence against our Asian American siblings. And I don't need to tell you that the events of this week made that even more urgent. And now I'm going to share just a little bit from Bishop Eaton's, the presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton's um, message that she sent this week in response to the, the mass shooting as a church, we grieve the mass shooting in Atlanta, Georgia, that took the lives of eight people, six of them Asian women. As a church, we join with Bishop Kevin Strickland of the South Southeastern Synod in observing that God has called us to become the beloved community that God created where all are valued and honored. We then are called through the waters of our baptism to strive for justice and peace in all the world, for all. There was also a church in Seattle, Grace Church, Grace Lutheran Church, which is a Chinese church that um, was the victim of racist message scrawled across their, their driveway. This church is in, is in Seattle. And responding to this instant, is incident, Shelley Brian Wee, Bishop of the Northwest Washington Synod said, the violence that is being done against people of Asian descent is, is heartrending and blasphemous. We are mindful that people are being injured and even killed in the name of bigotry. As a church, let us affirm the words of Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, a crime against any community is a crime against us all. As a church, we stand together to condemn the sins of racism, sexism, and xenophobia in all their forms. As a church, we lift up and pray for the support and protection of Grace Chinese Lutheran and its pastors, Jimmy Howe and Wendy Chu. We declare solidarity with our Asian American siblings. We lament with the families that lost loved ones in the shootings. We remember our neighbors working on the front lines of the pandemic, and we seek ways to support organizations that combat racial violence against all communities. This violence and aggression must stop. And as a church, a member church of the La Crosse Area Synod, where one of the world's largest groups of Hmong 
brothers and sisters reside, it is especially urgent for us to stand together with our Asian and, and Pacific Islander siblings to declare our support openly and to lament the, the ways that we are complicit in allowing racism and white supremacy to infect our, our country and even our church. And so our worship today begins with a call to worship and a, a prayer for communal confession that is written by that group of Asian and Pacific Islander ELCA members. And, and we will hear the hymn, we will sing the hymn, Come Now Prince of Peace, which is, is um, sung both in Taiwanese and in English. And we pray. O oh God of all, with wonderful diversity of languages and cultures, you created all people in your own human image. Free us from the prejudice and fear that we may see your face in the faces of our Asian siblings and people around the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God of all people and the whole of creation, make us into you who you have created us to be. Make us your hands, your feet, your eyes, your lips, your body in the world. Spirit of peace, reconcile us, connect us to yourself, to each other. You are the source of our healing and hope, for if one is hurt, all of us are hurt. Clothe us, your body in the world, with your love, mercy, and grace. Amen. Asian siblings are hurting. How do we, the church, hear their painful cry and act together in solidarity? We pray, Lord, have mercy. Are Asians invisible? They are branded as the model minority therefore not expected to speak up. They cry for justice. Can anyone hear them? We pray, Lord, have mercy. Asians are feared as a community. Asians have complex cultures and languages, so they are generally omitted. How can we, the church, offer our curiosity and respect when we encounter a multitude of gifts in diversity and uniqueness. We pray, Lord, have mercy. Asian children are called many names, most recently coronavirus, or yelled at to go home. When we, the church, ask, who is our neighbor? How can we truly mean it in welcoming words and actions? We pray, Lord, have mercy. Asians are used by the mainstream dominant culture to shame and put a wedge against other communities of color claiming our calling that all are created in God's image, how can we stand in solidarity with those hurting? We pray, Lord, have mercy. God's forgiveness is greater than any hurt and pain of the body. For Asian theology's forgiveness is an invitation to examine and re-examine what constitutes our identity. Not only our individual identity, but most especially our communal identity. May God's forgiveness invite us all to face who we are truly 
as members of the body of Christ. May this rich promise embrace us all, taking away the pain of our battered body. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, with steadfast love you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. 
But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello, friends. Psalm 51 is in front of us today, and if you've been playing along with the lectionary home game, you know that we last heard Psalm 51 on Ash Wednesday, weeks ago, and we've been following our journey through Lent since then. Today we're going to hear Psalm 51 with all kinds of possibilities for the renewed life. When I was a kid, I think I thought forgiveness worked like this. I said the right words about my mistakes, and then what came out of the vending machine was God's forgiveness. <laughs> what we hear in Psalm 51 is an array of, of rich metaphors and models for what a continually transformed life looks like. There's a refrain I want to teach you, and then you can join me on the verses too. Make a new heart, make a new heart in me today and every day. Make a new heart, make a new heart in me today and every day. Try that with me. Make a new heart, make a new heart in me today and every day. Make a new heart, make a new heart in me today and every day. And the verses, that's good, the verses are little lines that you can repeat if you like. Just as you made the earth, sky, and sea, and everything teeming in them. Just as you made the earth, sky, and sea, and everything teeming in them. Make a new heart. Make a new heart. Make a new heart in me today and every day. Make a new heart. Make a new of life in us. Restore our joy, restore our joy. Renew your breath of life in us. Restore our joy, restore our joy. Make a new heart, make a new heart in me today and every day. Make a new heart, make a new Can a person start over and change and be born again to new life? How can a person start over and change and be born again to new life? Well, make a new heart, make a new heart in me today and every day. Make a new heart, make a new heart. soften us to listen. Feel the heartbeat of the world and soften us to listen. Make a new heart, make a new heart in me today and every day. Make a new heart, make a new The second reading is from Hebrews chapter 5. 
Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now, my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was thunder. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Things fall apart. People break their covenant with God. We sin, we die. But come and see. And with the Greeks and Philip and Andrew, here at the end of Lent, we do see. We see the cross. We see Jesus is lifted up and at the same time, his death and his glorification. He is the falling seed that becomes the harvest. He is the hope for our trans transformation. God's forgiveness for all of us, for the least of us and the greatest of us, the wise and the not so wise. In Jesus alone, we come to see who God is. And then, seeing Jesus, we ourselves learn to turn with forgiveness, with mercy, with hope to our neighbors in need and to a creation groaning for new hope. Oh, 
Romans 8.22 says, All creation groans in this one great act of giving birth. This is from Wild Hope, Stories for Lent from the Vanishing. Look, I said, index finger tapping the dictionary entry. Lent, in its root word, means spring. My two young sons glanced out the window at the snow-covered yard. That means Lent is a time for us, like other living, living things in spring, to grow. The older boy nodded dutifully. The younger asked if he could have a cookie. Those two boys are adults now. In all the years they sat at our table, I never found a way to talk about Lent that made their faces light up and their limbs twitch with intrigue. Lent meant pained self-examination and fervent scouring of the internal house, fervency that faded as the season wore on. One year, I thought I'd found the way to enliven Lent. I learned that for centuries, the church had pointed to Noah's Ark as a symbol of our Lenten passage. Ah! A story featuring a boat massively bigger than grandpa's and animals which never failed to get our boy's attention. I dug out a basket for our ark, the small model animals already in the toy box, plus some new ones they eagerly picked out at the bookstore, would be the ark's lucky occupants. Each night after supper, one of the boys would choose an animal he wanted to put in the basket ark and tell us what he liked about that animal, why he was glad to have it on board, the amazing speed of the cheetah, the amazing acrobatics of the monkey, the eagle's amazing eye. They were attentive, I was engaged. Next, the spiritual application. Noah's story is our story, I told the boys. The ark is the church, the community that carries us across the roiling chaos of our lives, personal troubles and public tr troubles. All that water, it's the chaos. And also the water of baptism that strips off the tough husk we wear so that love can spill out of us. I watched my son's faces go blank. Their bodies slump in their chairs. They wanted to talk about the ark's screeching, leaping, hissing, slithering animals. Alas, the church gave no instruction on the animal's symbolic value. The animals were merely animals. All of this was before the words climate change and mass extinction floated in our shared cultural air. Biologists now tell us that the earth is undergoing its sixth mass extinction, species loss that is rapid. The first five extinctions spiraled out of geological cataclysms of one kind or another, an asteroid earth collision, tectonic plate shift, volcanic eruption. Today's cataclysm is a new kind. For the past century, whole species 
have been disappearing 100 times faster by conservative estimates than in the past because the choices about shelter, food, transportation, communication, and leisure that we humans make every day are pounding the planet. We are laying waste the animal's only home, which is the only home of human animals too. This beautiful blue-green globe is the one ark we all ride. The boys had it right all along. Attention to the amazingness of our ark mates routes us directly to the heart of Lent. The season meant to rouse us from our self-absorption, absorbed instead in the beauty of other creatures, we see how they value their lives, lives woven together across species in beautifully complex webs. The nine ounce red knot flies from the southern tip of the world to meet the horseshoe crab at precisely the week that she crawls from the waters of Delaware Bay to lay her eggs. Once alive to the exquisite web holding all creatures, we also see the holes slashed through it by us. We're enraptured by the animal's beauty and we're horrified by the suffering we inflict on that beauty. With St. Paul, we can hear all creation groaning including ourselves. I didn't hear all creation groaning when my sons were young. I was oblivious to the millions dying, their kinds never to be seen on the earth again. If I had known, I wonder if I would have been able to tell the boys. They had not yet learned to feel themselves separate from any living thing a separation we adults find necessary to function efficiently. Probably they would have cried, or maybe in rage thrown things. Certainly they'd have been confused about the creator who I told them cared for the falling of the smallest sparrow. Sad, angry, confused, they would have suffered with the suffering of God's beauty which would have brought us to the white hot core of Lent. Not a place I want to go, much less bring children to, but a place I now can't avoid. The first Christmas, my sons were both in their 20s. I was at my childhood home and noticed the new issue of National Geographic. Ruffling through it, I saw a feature story on those great orange apes, orangutans. A quick glance at the pictures told me this was not a story that would enhance holiday cheer. I put the magazine at the bottom of the pile and tried to forget about it. But one of the pictures, eight baby orangutans in a wheelbarrow, kept swimming in my mind. A month later, I gave in. I found the magazine and read the story. A few days later, a friend gave me an article from Audubon magazine about the amazing imperiled red knot. The global wave of animal suffering caught up with me. It has indeed taken me to the red, white hot core of Lent, where I have felt broken open and sick at the revelation that the way we live is each year killing millions of magnificent, innocent creatures of all kinds. I've had to see and confess that my habits of body, mind, and heart aid the slaughter of God's beauty. 2,000 years ago, long before the current extinction crisis, St. Paul heard all creatures groaning. We human creatures are groaning, he said, because we've had some glimpse of who we might be and it's painful to wait for our full transformation into persons of unbounded love and compassion. Other creatures already fully themselves groan in the pain that humans inflict on them. They suffer sacrificially because of and for us. 
If we'll hear them groaning, they'll midwife our birth into new lives of unbounded compassion. What Paul called the glorious liberty of the children of God. Then our freedom will be their freedom. This book is a story of those animals. Each uh, week there is a story of a, a species that is facing hunger or having its habitat destroyed, that is being threatened by pollution and, and other um, agents that are killing it, others that are being hunted, trafficked, sold. And there are also stories of hope. But all of these stories are meant to capture the miracle and the peril of each creature. And each is meant to startle us awake to the state of our own hearts, to the state of the world that we made and we've lived in. They're meant to awaken us with a wild hope that something new might be born. The promise of Lent is that something will be born of the ruin, something so astoundingly better than the present moment that we can't yet imagine it. Lent is seeded with resurrection. The resurrection promises that a new future will be given to us when we beg to be stripped of the life of separation, when the hard husk suffocating our hearts breaks open, and like children again, we feel the suffering of other creatures, of other people, of all other beings as part of our own selves. That this can happen is the wild, but not impossible hope of creation. The author writes, if I had it to do again, I would tell my young sons about the suffering and deaths of the amazing animals they love. I would let their hearts be broken. Then I would tell them that hearts broken open in love create a new ark. That when we suffer in love together, a suffering love beyond us can birth through us a new world where they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. This is what we and all creatures groan for, this more beautiful world that lies quietly waiting in every heart. And if we have any doubt that this is possible, Today's gospel lesson tells us, shows us how it happens when a seed falls into the earth, maybe even is buried there by the powers that want to destroy it. And yet it breaks open. It breaks open in the earth and new life springs forth. Life that I can't control. I I have always believed that planting a garden is the most spiritual act anyone can do, that farmers are the most spiritual of any profession because you can plant the seed and you can water it, but you can't make it grow. You can't make it bear fruit. All you can do is surrender to the power that is greater than you. And today we see Jesus talking about what is to come in Holy Week, the seed buried in the earth that breaks open, that springs forth with new life, that cannot be controlled, that cannot be bound, but is set on the loose to transform the world one soul at a time, one spirit at a time. May our Lent be a spring, be a season of awareness of the suffering in our world, 
the breaking open of our hearts with awareness and compassion. And then the springing forth of love, of that very love that heals, that transforms, that makes all things new. Through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Thanks be to God. this, the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent, let us offer both our laments and our petitions to God. When I say, in your steadfast love, join me in responding, have mercy on us. We pray. O oh God, we lament that over the past months, Many Christians have not been able to assemble in person for worship. Many believers, many in our communities, have languished in isolation. Strengthen all Christians in every church around the globe in the covenant of their baptism. Equip our children, our teachers, our leaders, our Sunday school students and confirmation students in service projects, in learning, and strengthen all of us as we grow in our faith. O oh, faithful God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament that by indulging our own desires, we have misused your creation and have worsened the poverty of others. Continue your care for the earth you have made. Protect animals and their habitats. Grant weather that prepares the soil for seeds and shelter all lands from violent storms, flooding, wildfires. Almighty God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament that as a nation we have not ensured justice for all and equal access to the freedoms and necessities of life. We lament the prejudice that infects our hearts, 
and communities, the violence that breaks out in our streets and in our homes, bring an end to warfare and terrorism, fill our courts with truth, wisdom, guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that are rooted in and reflect your mercy, justice, and peace. Give us all the creativity and imagination to see the world as it could be, beyond as it is. Communities that work for the well-being of all. Righteous God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament the sufferings of people the world over. We lament the sorrows of the pandemic. We lament hunger, homelessness, and loneliness. End this pandemic. Provide vaccinations to all persons around the world, especially those who are most vulnerable, especially those who are currently being denied access. Guide us in healing the sick, welcoming the migrant, feeding the hungry, and living with others in harmony. Give us the strength to do what is right for our health and well-being and for the health and well-being of others, even when it is the hard thing to do. Benevolent God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament the hopelessness that afflicts so many people. We lament the anguish of refugee camps, of overcrowded hospitals, of unhappy homes. And we pray, as this Thursday we celebrate the Annunciation of the birth of Jesus to Mary, instill us with gratitude for your presence among all humankind, for holding us through our sorrows, for leading us into joy. O oh, compassionate God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament the violence, the prejudice, the hate that has been inflicted on those of Asian and Pacific Islander descent. Transform the hearts of your people that we may see one another as brothers and sisters, as allies, that we may stand up for justice, for peace, that you may show us how to give ourselves in defense of those who are powerless, who are overlooked, who are marginalized, O oh, suffering servant, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We lament those, the death of those who have gone before us in faith. And we praise you for those who have given us words for our lament and our praise. And at the end of time, bring us with all of those who have died in the faith into your everlasting presence. Everlasting God, in your steadfast love, have mercy on us. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, Father of glory, in your bountiful spirit, and in the name of Jesus the Christ, now and forever. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And may you share that greeting of peace with one another, remembering that our sharing of peace is a making of peace in our hearts, in our homes, in our communities. Amen. Oh, yeah.
Let us share the meal that Jesus gave to us, asking us to share in remembrance of him. We remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup he gave thanks and he gave it for them all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Leaders take the bread and the wine, and share it with those who are gathered with you, saying, this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may this, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Hello, I am Pastor Gigi Sierra Grant, President of the Association of Asians and Pacific Islanders of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I represent a community that is so culturally diverse and multilingual. We are Chinese, Indonesian, Indian, South Asian, Korean, Laotian, Hmong, Japanese, Cambodian, Thai, Filipino, and even Hawaiian of Japanese extraction. But we're all grouped together as Asians and Pacific Islanders. Since the pandemic began in March of last year, there have been more than 3,000 reported incidents of anti-Asian racism. Some of these incidents involved elderly persons being stopped, berated, harassed, spat on, coughed upon, and blamed for COVID deaths. As church together, we ask that you stand in solidarity with us against anti-Asian racism. One way of doing this is to designate a day of lament. A new ELCA worship resource has been developed for the Day of Lament, and it includes a prayer of blessing and healing that is so unique and beautiful. This prayer is called Embodied Blessing and Healing, created by the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity for an anti-Asian violence protest in Oakland, California. Pastor Tita Valeriano from our own community participated in that protest and has shared this with us. 
The embodied blessing and healing is powerful because it is movement done in silence. There are no words, but it speaks from the heart. I've invited several Asian leaders representing different caucuses to join me in showing you how to use the embodied blessing and healing. Mrs. Lily Wu, Chinese from Queens, New York. Pastor D. Gurning, Indonesian from Seattle, Washington. Pastor Daniel Panamaka, Indian from Floral Park, New York. Pastor Nuuk Va, Hmong from St. Paul, Minnesota. And Pastor Tita Valeriano, Filipina from Sacramento, California. And I'm also Filipina from Columbia, Maryland. Pastor Tita Valeriano, who serves as director for evangelical mission and assistant to the bishop in the Sierra Pacific Synod, will be leading us in this demonstration. First, I will demonstrate this embodied blessing and healing with a brief meaning and you can follow me. Then we will do it together in silence and movement together. Let us begin. Take a deep breath and exhale. Hands on one's heart. It means I see myself, acknowledge my own feelings, my own body. Bow, acknowledging sacredness, resilience, humanity, strength in myself. Look around, it means I see you. Hands to ear, it means I hear you. Arms cross chest, it means mourning, feeling collective sadness, grief, lament, anger. Bow, acknowledging sacredness, resilience, humanity, strength in others. Open hands, palms up with a breath. Receiving blessings from God and from one another. Touching my heart with one hand and extending the others to yours. It means heart to heart compassion. And let us now begin this embodied blessing and healing together in silence. Let us begin by taking a deep breath. And God's people say, Amen.